Okay, good morning. Uh, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Scott Patterson with ILC Dover. Uh, ILC Dover is an innovative company working in the single use area, uh, mostly for high containment for the manufacturing of HPAPI or the small molecule part. Uh, today's presentation is on single use technology for containment during ADC handling, ADC, uh, the anti -drug, uh, antibody drug conjugate. So, uh, again, anti antibody drug conjugates are becoming more popular, although there's uh, not many that have been approved by the FDA yet, but uh, there's a robust pipeline leading to uh, potentially a $10 billion market in the, in the next few years. The challenge, uh, particularly with the uh, antibody drug conjugate, is we're combining a small molecule, a highly potent toxic material that's going to target a treatment area uh, by using a large molecule, a monoclonal antibody, to create that ability to target uh, the treatment. So these small molecules are extremely potent, but again, delivering a very, very toxic uh, uh, delivery to a cancer, tumor, uh, so forth. So there's a lot of extra controls that need to go in into the manufacturing process of the, um, of the small molecule, and this is where it becomes extremely costly when looking at those containment or isolation devices. So here's the typical uh, antibody drug conjugate. Uh, again, for the most part, we'll focus on the cytotoxic agent, which is the uh, payload or warhead, mostly referred to as the payload. And this is a toxic small molecule which uh, has, uh, has, needs to be isolated from operator exposure and exposure to the environment during manufacturing. It's hard to sort of realize what uh, 30 nanograms per cubic meter in an airborne concentration is, but uh, the human eye can, uh, can identify less than 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So this is something you can't see, something that you can't sense. So the controls, the engineering controls are quite critical to make sure uh, that operators and the environment are not exposed. Again, the other parts of the antibody drug conjugate, the antibody, the, the large molecule, and then a linker to connect all of these together. So what are the benefits of using single-use uh, products in the, in the ADC process? Well, first of all, they have to work. They have to maintain this containment level, this, this uh, minuscule 30 nanograms per cubic meter. So uh, there is data uh, proven uh, that the uh, flexible single-use isolators will do this. The next benefit is really the lack of cleaning. So anytime you're dealing with highly toxic uh, products, uh, the cleaning, the cleaning validation, uh, all of this is extremely critical so that we don't have cross-contamination. So cross-contamination can be in the sense of uh, product A gets into product B in a multi-use facility or cross-contamination from batch one into batch two. So, by using a single-use system and reducing the cleaning process, we reduce the risk of cross-contamination. Also, the, uh, really the capital expenditure for doing uh, isolation or containment of these small molecules, these payloads, is, is much less when using a single-use type of product. Uh, the conventional stainless steel glass type of isolators cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement and deploy for these containment levels, where single-use systems are typically going to be uh, well under $100,000 and often less than 20% uh, of that of the capital expenditure cost of a uh, hard wall type of device. Uh, and then finally, the single-use systems are extremely flexible. So we know in, in the biologics world that flex factories are are highly desirable, uh, trying to get into a ballroom type of uh, concept. Well, using single-use systems like flexible isolators, you're able to uh, repurpose the equipment, redesign the equipment on the run, make changes and so forth. So it really allows for process flexibility. So containment uh, of the chemical synthesis of an HPAPI. So uh, when dealing with these, the first thing uh, that's common is to have a risk assessment. We have to understand you know, the hazard that we're dealing with and, and what the risks are. So typical standard uh, risk uh, management processes like ICHQ9 can be used. A lot of pharmaceutical biologic companies have their own processes for risk management. 
but ICHQ9 is, is one of the most common. And there we want to differentiate the hazard from the risk. The hazard is we're dealing with a highly toxic, potent compound, and the risk is what is the potential for that to uh, have exposure to the operators or the environment. So we use the clever, clever analogy of the tiger. So on the left, we have the tiger in your front yard. He's very hungry. He wants to eat. So he's, he's a big hazard, and he's a big risk. But we put the tiger in the cage. Well, we still have a hazard. He's still hungry, and he still wants to eat, but it's low risk because we've got him in a cage. So that's our engineering control. We put him in a cage. Going through the risk assessment, it's critical to do this to understand, well, what should the controls be? You can overspend in the plant uh, design in implementing the engineering controls, like with the, uh, the tiger. Do we just need a cage? Do we need the cage and a guard? Uh, so these type of decisions during the risk assessment can mean the difference of overspending on a plant or facility or underspending and have to go back and rework the facility. So when we look at the risk assessment, here's a couple of uh, real examples instead of the tiger. So looking at an ADC compound, uh, it goes through a conjugation process where we take the solid form, uh, the small molecule, conjugate it, and now we have it in liquid. And, and products in liquid, toxic products in liquid, have much less of a risk, if you will, uh, because they can't get airborne. They can't... Uh, 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 operators can't be exposed from a standpoint of uh, respiratory exposure. So the risk is, is very low because it's in liquid, but the hazard is very high because it's still an ADC compound. So we, we take a look at the uh, typical process with tangential flow filtration and say, well, what's the risk here? Well, there could be a bad connection. We could have some leakage or dripping of the ADC uh, compound into the environment, or we could have aerosolization uh, through a leak or, or, uh, or a bad uh, connection, and so we want an isolator. Here's where a flexible isolator will come into play because for a small amount of money compared to hard wall technology, uh, you can implement a, a flexible isolator. A different example would be handling the ADC itself in solid form. Uh, so the ADC, the payload, I'm sorry, it's uh, really the raw HPAPI, uh, has a very high hazard and a very high risk. It's high risk because powders can get airborne, and again, now inhalation exposure is, is a, a high potential. So here we look at flexible isolators that have negative pressure controls. So we're doing a belt and suspenders kind of thing because we have a high risk and a high hazard. So one of the key issues of containment of any toxic compound is contain at the source. So it's very common in a lot of these processes where open handling is still done and it's very risky. The idea being that during the opening hand, open handling, you could use a fume hood or local exhaust ventilation or PPE with, combined with these. But it's very, it's very risky because as these powders uh, can get airborne and travel throughout a facility or just the processing suite, uh, can cause a, a need for a lot, a, a lot more additional cleaning and the potential of exposure to operators. So here's where we say contain at the source, don't do open handling and have some type of isolation containment uh, that you can rely on. Again, there's a big difference when we look at the typical monoclonal antibody processing where it's in liquids and most of the time you're looking at protecting the product from the environment and the operators. You're, you're in an aseptic type of process. But in the ADC payload, we have a powder that has to be transferred from process to process. It can get airborne. It's a drug substance. It's not a drug product, so it is toxic and, and potent. And so the risk uh, of handling these payloads is extremely high. So the chemical synthesis process is, is that of uh, all APIs. Uh, where, where there's a, a chemical reaction process, an isolation process, and drying. Uh, but the big risk here is we start off with non-potent materials, and as we go through the chemical reaction processes, potency begins to go up, so we go from a non-potent to a highly potent. Oftentimes, once we get through the process, the material goes back for additional chemistry to increase the potency even more, and with the payload on an ADC, there can be 
five, 10 steps of going back to have rechemistry getting more and more potent. These transfer points handling powders are a lot different than handling liquids, and so there's certainly a large risk in handling those powders. Again, they can get airborne, uh, uh, can have operator exposure with, uh, with really bad uh, effects. Uh, the next part of the ADC manufacturing that causes risk is the fact that there's usually multiple facilities involved in the manufacturing process, and some of those facilities are also multi-use facilities, meaning they're making many different compounds. So here we see that we start off that one factory may, be, may make the payload and linker, um, and this is in a solid form, so this is where we have that high hazard and high risk. Uh, this is the drug substance. Another facility would make the monoclonal antibody, and then possibly another uh, facility would do the conjugation, and then the downstream processing, filtration, purification, filling, and so forth. The downstream processes are, again, a little bit less risk because it's being contained in a process, transfers are in liquid and closed, but still we're, we're, we're looking to have isolation and containment to protect against aerosolization. So one of the ways to help with this is negative pressure or possibly even positive pressure control. So imagine a flexible film isolator and often referred to as a bag or a glove bag, but these are, are highly efficient containment devices and merely connect a uh, pressure system to either hold a negative pressure for high containment or a positive pressure often used when you're trying to create an aseptic condition. All of this is going through HEPA filtration. So the negative pressure control or a positive pressure control is there as again part of the belts and suspenders uh, when we have high risk and we need to assure that there's not going to be exposure to operators or to the environment. So a couple of examples of what, what does this stuff look like. So here on the left we have a, uh, a reactor solids charge. So uh, typically when we're dealing with a payload, we're not dealing with a large volume of material. It's still a, uh, a mass transfer that has to be done. So we see the isolator that's mounted above a reactor. Uh, here we're seeing it in positive pressure, which is not for the containment yet. In this case, in this process, uh, they needed to have a low particulate level before they opened the nozzle of the reactor. So what we're seeing is the purge process here, and it shows the isolator nicely with the gloves, but we're purging that to uh, filter out the particulate. There's a particle counter on the system. Once we reach the correct particulate level, then the system turns negative, and the nozzle can be opened and charging of the, um, of the solid can occur. On the right, we're showing the same system, uh, showing a glass reactor set up without the flexible isolator and then, then with the flexible isolator. And this is just to really show that yeah, reactors can be complicated. We have utilities, gases, liquids, and so forth. So you can see the picture in the middle. There are pass-throughs and manifolds and bulkheads that all of these can be connected to still allow for a flexible isolator as seen on the right to be used. Uh, to achieve the high containment uh, of the process. Again, here's a, a different part of the chemical synthesis process in drying. So in a lot of the ADC processing uh, or the chemical synthesis of the payload of the ADC, uh, the drying is done in a uh, vacuum tray dryer. Uh, so here we see the operators working through a flexible isolator, uh, loading the trays or unloading the trays. Uh, again, one of the interesting issues that we get to with uh, flexible containment, as you can see this operator in the front, is turned 90 degrees to the isolator. He has a lot of ergonomics, uh, a lot of ergonomic benefits that are realized by working with a flexible film isolator because it moves with the person, where these hard wall isolators are really fixed to the torso of the operator, very difficult, and, and ergonomics are extremely difficult. Now here, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, in these processes, a restricted access barrier system, RABS might be used because it's so difficult to get containment, but with a flexible uh, uh, isolator, it, it, it is possible to get, to get containment even on a, uh, on a vacuum tray dryer. And then also, again, looking at the risk in belts and suspenders, again, when we're highly toxic uh, uh, products, these high-potent APIs, oftentimes we look at 
do, going through an FMEA and saying, well, there's a weak point in the design, we need to compensate for that, and again, back to the belt and suspender approach. So here in this process, the discharge of a powder into a continuous liner or endless liner that's then sitting inside a flexible isolator with a negative pressure control. So that's our secondary containment. And then that is processed or packaged out of the isolator through another single-use technology called bag out. And so the powder in the continuous liner is bagged out, which gives us another level of protection. That product is now safe to handle openly as it's transferred to the next process or possibly off to quality. So going through a, a good FMEA process will allow to understand what the risks are and then to look how those can be mitigated with uh, combining technologies uh, for protection. A big part of uh, using single-use technology is the containment culture and training. Uh, it's really no different than using any hard stainless steel type of equipment, but, but there are techniques that need to be learned and trained, and we find that operator training and establishing the SOPs are an absolute key to the performance. We find that facilities that have a containment culture actually are able to drive down their containment levels quite a bit. Uh, by, by working with the operators. And again, it is, this, this is required under regulatory guidelines, whether it be the CGMP guidelines of operator training or whether it be mandates uh, in the United States by OSHA or some of the European regulating bodies. So containment assessments, once uh, in handling powders, this is a key thing to have an industrial hygienist uh, go through and do containment assessments and collect data to say, are we contained, are we, are we making sure we're not exposing the facility or the, uh, the operators to, to these compounds. So really the containment culture is, is there for uh, having the operators encouraged to, to have continuous improvement, uh, refresh training on a regular basis to make sure the systems uh, are always operated in the best possible way. Look at where there are gaps and do redesigns because on single-use products, uh, you're able to go in and do a redesign, do improvements, uh, fill in gaps because it's a consumables business. The next time you would need to purchase the consumables, you can do a redesign and improve uh, on, the, on the next process. So again, number one thing here in dealing with ADCs is the elimination of cleaning. So we've already understood that we have to have the containment levels, high containment in the nanogram level, but it's really eliminating the cleaning issues. And, and again, we have regulatory guidelines like uh, GMP Chapter 5.21 that tells us about cleaning and tells us that there is no such thing as perfectly clean and no matter how much you clean there's still going to be retention on surfaces. There's nothing you can do on a piece of process equipment but in your containment device if that can be a single-use product that's disposed of instead of cleaned then there's a massive cost savings. Again the cost savings comes from uh, reducing the cleaning, all the cleaning protocols, all the hold times, uh, the manufacturing of WFI, uh, the floor space needed for cleaning, all of that is reduced. So with single-use products, even on some of these toxic compounds, there can be a wet-in-place done or a deactivation of the compound, so it's no longer as hazardous as it is in, in its uh, real form. And then uh, uh, safe removal and disposal of the single-use product. So just a, an example here, a real quick example. These are the exact same systems that do the exact same process in the exact same plant. This was not an ADC plant, but we're just using it for an example. So on the left-hand side, you can see the hard wall stainless steel and glass system. On the right is the flexible film isolator. On the left, this system has over or almost 20,000 square inches that needs to be cleaned. This is a lot of cleaning, plus all the gloves need to be cleaned, which those are, those, that's a complicated process. With that, in the cleaning of the gloves, uh, one of the most common failures of these type of isolators is, is the gloves start to fatigue from chemical exposure, from all the cleaning. On the right, we, we have a flexible film isolator that we're going to dispose of every time uh, after use. It's, it's only 4,000 square inches of cleaning left after we remove the, uh, the flexible isolator. And the gloves, which tend to be the weak point in these type of isolation systems, are also thrown away. We have customers ask us, well, can I reuse the gloves? Why do you want to do that? It's just less expensive not to clean, dispose of it, and then move on to the next consumable. 
Okay, so quick, quick summary. Why single-use systems for ADC handling? One, the containment levels have been proven. Uh, a lot of data exists to show that these are as safe as other devices that are used. Uh, we can apply these to solids handling in the chemical synthesis process of the payload, and we can apply it to downstream processing when handling uh, liquids to protect from spills and aerosolization and things like that. Again, CapEx significantly less, uh, and the concept that, uh, that yes, a single-use system can be put in place and the CapEx is less, but over time the costs catch up is just not true. When you eliminate cleaning, you eliminate all the validation and so forth, you eliminate a, a significant cost. So the ongoing cost of ownership of using a single-use system is less. Efficiency is better in a multi-use facility. Again, you're able to set up and move things around with these type of isolators. You can use a ballroom strategy, uh, connect pieces together, and so efficiency is, is much better. And then also continuous improvement. Facilities are always being repurposed. Uh, designs are changing, processes uh, change, and by using single-use technology, you can repurpose, re revise, and change it as you go. Okay, so that's the uh, presentation on single-use isolators. Scott, Scott, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Um, I am going to ask if anyone does have a quick question for Scott um, right now, and if not, you can always... Um, oh, okay, there we go. How about the risk uh, for the flexible systems when especially there could be possibility of uh, any damage? or pinholes, uh, they might uh, uh, extract even the unclean air inside in case of such uh, pinholes. Right, right, so that's, that's the common question is uh, you have the potential of pinholes and or from the welding um, that, that you could have a failure there. So a robust system uh, in the manufacturing process goes through inflation dwell tests at high enough pressures not only to find any small pinhole, but to stress the welds to make sure that they're strong enough. And then that can be duplicated at time of installation. So particularly with a pressure control system attached, you can go through a pressure dwell test to make sure that there are no pinholes or, or any issues of failure in the uh, flexible wall. Okay. 